divesting gone horribly wrong. Tracy McCarter intentionally marries an alcoholic white man and suffers the dire consequences. James Murray, 48, raised hell in the halls of his Amsterdam Avenue building in the afternoon, ringing bells on his neighbor's doors, said Super Raphael Fermin. He was very drunk, ringing all the doorbells in the apartment, said Fermin, 51. Ringing all the bells, trying to get someone to let him in. Murray's frenzied efforts around 3.30 p.m. included trying to get into his own third-floor apartment. Fermin said he didn't assist Murray because only Murray's wife, Tracy McCarter, is on the lease. When he saw the super coming, Murray stepped, pit away, Fermin said, but more chaos was to come that night. Around 9 p.m., Fermin's daughter alerted him to screams for help echoing through the building near West 92nd Street, and he ran to find McCarter. 44, over her husband's bloodied body inside their apartment, the super recalled. She was screaming, come help or he is going to die. Fermin said, she had towels on his chest trying to stop the bleeding. He was, lying, facing up inside the apartment, behind the door, continued the super. The blood was covering the floor and she was screaming for help. Murray was pronounced dead at Mount Sinai Morningside Hospital, formerly St. Luke's. McCarter, whose social media profiles indicate is a registered nurse, was arrested early Tuesday on charges of murder and criminal possession of a weapon. McCarter has no prior NYPD record, and there was no history of domestic incidents reported at their home, authorities said. Murray was, however, hospitalized after a dispute between the couple in July 2019 due to his level of intoxication, police said. He told cops at the time that he was an alcoholic and relapsed. Murray had another stumble just last week, Fermin said. Tenants came and told me someone was laying in front of the building, he said. An ambulance came for him. According to Tracy, here's what she said. Before March 2nd, 2020, my life looked great from the outside. I was living in New York City, having snagged a coveted job as a nurse at Wild Cornell Medical Center, crown jewel of the New York Presbyterian NYP hospital system. The previous May, I had married the love of my life, a man I met six years before. I had birthed four kids by the time I was 20, but now all my children were out of the house and thriving. I was excelling in my master's degree nursing courses at Columbia University. When I graduated high school, I was already a mom of two, and I passed up a chance to attend Yale, too intimidated by the idea at the time. Now, I was seizing a second chance. The night of March 2nd, 2020, my drunken husband came to my home, choked me, and tried to take my purse. I screamed for help. No one came. I grabbed a knife to try to scare him away. It did not work. Deciding it was safer to give him the money he was demanding, I put the knife away to look for my wallet. When I was unable to find it, he became more enraged. He launched himself at me again. As a nurse, I knew better than many the danger I faced when he put me in chokeholds, simultaneously compressing both my carotid arteries. I knew each time he did this, he could easily choke me to death. To defend myself, I grabbed another knife. He stumbled coming at me, impaling himself on the blade. I called 911. I was desperate to save him. The wound proved too grievous. He died. When the ambulance arrived, so did the police. I was arrested within minutes. Denied bail, I was taken to Rikers Island one of the country's most notorious jails. Most people there are incarcerated pretrial, meaning they have not been found guilty by a court of law. Yet the correctional officers immediately started calling me inmate, refusing to use the term detainee as mandated by the New York City Board of Corrections. My husband had a history of abusing his ex-wife, was videotaped abusing me, admitted the abuse in writing, and was witnessed rampaging through our building earlier in the day before I arrived home. Just 10 days before trial, when it became clear their shoddy evidence would be exposed in court, Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg conceded he did not even believe I committed murder. 
he dropped the charges against me. Yet I have no doubt, he and the court would have happily accepted a plea that cost me my career. I was forced to remain in New York City unemployed. My arrest also resulted in losing my place in school. While I was jailed, my family tried to contact Columbia University. They didn't respond. It wasn't until I was home waiting through emails that I found a letter stating that Columbia had placed me on interim suspension. I was considered persona non grata, barred from their properties. The university stated that I was suspected of committing gender-based misconduct. I couldn't re-enroll in classes, they said, for the safety of the community. I cried for a long time. My victimization was being twisted back on me. I fought Columbia. I pointed out they were violating their own policy because classes had transitioned to Zoom. They relented, a bit. I was back in class, but still physically barred. Meanwhile, barred from the hospital, I tried to find other employment. A dismal pattern began, I would get an offer, only for the arrest to show up on the background check. Offers were pulled. I stopped applying. Do you feel sorry for her? Although it was self-defense, this is what happens when you marry alcoholic white men. What was it about an alcoholic white male that Tracy, the RN and a student at Columbia University found so intriguing? You tell me. Divesting gone wrong. 